Uh, play rehearse. How does that look for you? Good. I now just have to move the thing out of the way so it's not. <laughs> I gotta put you guys off to the side here somewhere. Um, I guess I can minimize it. Oh, that might work. No, but then I can't see any faces. Oh, then I can see one person. That's good. I see Ashley. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, as I was saying earlier, this is a talk that I have not. Um, I have not the time, so we, we might go over the time. I'm gonna to try to keep track. We might go under, I'm not sure. Um, this is not gonna be a, a ton of new material for people. It's going to be something people who, for people who have studied um, the roots of European liberalism, it's going to be um, a familiar story, but it's nice sometimes to connect these things in order to sort of position ourselves. Uh, within um, the framework, I think, of, of what the, the FICT uh, Institute is supposed to do, is it trying to do. So I want to talk today about some of the philosophical roots of European liberal, liberalism in civil society. And this topic may seem far uh, at first from the Fragmentary Institute of Comparative Timelines speculative world building, world building project which is aimed at defamiliarizing European colonialism and, and imagining alternative historical narratives. But this, project, um, this project aim can also be rephrased, I think, um, in similar terms as the question of what if European enlightenment in the 17th century and 18th centuries and ultimately modernity had never happened. Oh, this has got to work somehow. Okay. So for even if uh, European colonialism starts much earlier, and we can see here that it really starts around the 1400s with uh, Portuguese colonialism, European colonialism really only takes off or takes off in a, in a massive way, we can say, in the 1600s. But it's not so much a question of intensity that's important here. Rather, I'm positing that European colonialism cannot be separated from enlightenment of which the philosophy of European liberalism is very much a part. And let me lay out some of the reasons for, for this, this connection that I'm trying to draw here. The first is that while European liberalism provides the conceptual grounds for the modern political subject and modern system of self-governance, it also provides the legal institutional structure for property ownership, labor, and the capitalist market in ways that work to rationalize European colonialism in the past. The second, and it's related to the above, I think, uh, is that as a number of thinkers have already argued, despite the claim to be working to secure the equality of all men, and really they're only talking about men in, this, in the text that I'm gonna be talking about, that's problematic for all sorts of other reasons. European liberalism ultimately establishes notions of personhood as a prerequisite for becoming a modern subject with agency and citizenship that is limited only to white males of European descent. Uh, the philosophy scholar Charles W. Mills, who um, uh, I'm going to be leaning on heavily in this talk. So uh, Mills calls this prerequisite of European liberalism, of European liberalism, he calls it its, its racial contract. And he identifies the racial contract as the critical, com critical component to that underwrites liberalism's mythical social contract theory. So he's a really important thinker for me because the way in which he, he shows that, that that racial contract is really at the core, it's the unspoken tacit core of, of liberal theory. And it's very important to, to bring that into words. But what he's saying by this, in other words, is that European colonialism did not operate through brute force alone. It drew its legitimacy from Europe's philosophy of liberalism, specifically its founding notion of the state of nature in social contract theory. And this can be a really important aspect here. But to put this a little bit differently, we have to treat social contract theory as part of the discursive apparatus that enabled colonialism in the past and I should say neo-colonialism neo in, in the present. I'm gonna to try to speak slow and I'm going to, I have a tendency to speed up, but I'm going to try to keep this slow in order to, to accommodate the different um, times and different languages. <clears throat> 
So the state of nature is a key component. It's a key concept that I'm going to be talking about and it's a key uh, um, concept in this text. While it is important for ways that I'm gonna be talking about a little bit later, it's also of special interest for me due to my obsession, and I'll call it an obsession, no, <laughs> admit to this, my obsession with recent post-apocalyptic science fiction. And here I've put up some of the titles of the more relevant works in this genre that have inspired my thinking and continue to inspire my thinking. And I'm gonna come back to these at the end, if not just to show the kinds of possibilities that I see in, the, in these works. In any case, for now, what I find interesting about these works is the way that they try to imagine the emergence of a social order, and in some, case, as a, in some cases, even a, a legitimate and moral system of political authority in the post-apocalypse after the collapse of civilization. Interestingly, um, in so doing, they all go back in some way to a kind of state of nature as the starting point to imagine a different kind of society. So they're reproducing what is at the core of liberal, liberal theory that I'm gonna be showing, but they're trying to imagine it in a different way. So it's interesting to think of science fiction as trying to do it again, but trying to get it right this time. So for me, that's a, it's an interesting way to think about that, um, the, the shift in narrative. So I'm bringing that together. So let's, let's try to define this term, um, what I'm talking about when I say the, the state of nature, what exactly does that mean? So is in so far as different authors are going to describe the state of nature in very different ways, we can say that essentially the state of nature is the idea of human beings devoid of all institutional forms and organizational systems that we think of today as necessary for society. Such institutional forms and, and organization includes government, political structures, police, army, and so on. Now, since all these things are, uh, are things that we think of as central to humanity, we can say that the state of nature is really the human without humanity or the human without society. Now, I've put up two pictures here from the state of nature, one from the sort of philosophical text, and this is all just sort of so, um, skim from the internet. And the other is some random post-apocalyptic scene, which you can find um, uh, uh, endless amounts of these kinds of scenes. I think this one's actually from a computer game or, or whatnot. But um, I put up diff two different scenes here of, of the state of nature. Everybody sees the screen, right? The, the, okay, so I don't know how this appears on your end. So in pushing this idea a bit, it's helpful to consider the contemporary social thinker, this idea of the state of nature. It's helpful to think, um, uh, it's helpful to consider the contemporary social thinker, Bruce Jennings, who argues that the state of nature is a philosophical device that is used to argue about humans in nature, but also the underlying nature of humans. And that's an important aspect because the state of nature is humans in nature, but also the nature of human beings. So it's trying to say something universal about the underlying nature of the human being. Um, sorry about the noise in the background here. The state of nature thus performs rhetorically in these texts as an argument for the necessity of a social order and for the particular form that that social order must take. That is, it tells us not only that we need society, but also what kind of society we need. So it's a very important um, um, aspect in these texts. Now, I want to consider three seminal texts of European uh, liberal theory, classic liberalism, as it's called. The first is Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan. The second is John Locke's Treatise on Government. And finally, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Discourse on Inequality. And I want to show that despite Jennings' suggestion that the state of nature is a philosophical device, it's not always clear whether these authors really use the state of nature as a philosophical device or whether they see it as an actual state of evolution of society. And I'm actually going to say that it's the latter that's the case. So um, that's important to, to, it will become important ways that I'll, that I'll map out. So to put it simply, they seem to want to have it both ways. Now this is problematic since as Mills tells us, Charles Mills, who I mentioned before, the state of nature becomes a hypothetical condition or almost a thought experiment in relation to white males, white European males in European society, but then it becomes an actual condition in relation, in relation to, the West, to, to the rest of the world. 
or as Mills will, will um, um, uh, accurately say this, the literal state of nature is reserved for non-whites, while for whites, the state of nature is only hypothetical, okay? So in Europe, the state of nature denotes, and so what does he mean by this actually, right? So in Europe, the state of nature denotes a pre-political condition in which white men with the supposed capacity for rational politics have yet to establish a social contract. It is thus a pre-social condition that can only be activated by white Europeans. It is thus a hypothetical state denoting a potential for modern subjecthood and citizenship. Now, everywhere else in the world, however, the state of nature is going to be treated as an actual condition, a kind of savage territory devo devoid of full, fully full humans or fully human people, and thus persons capable of becoming um, citizen, citizens and subjects of agency and history. And it is this incommensurability that gives European colonialism its sense of legitimacy. Then this is very important. And what is more, it becomes clear that in describing the evolution from a state of nature into a social contract of European liberalism, these authors that I'm going to be talking about claim to be doing empirically objective descriptive work when actually they are producing a normative argument for a certain worldview and more specifically, an argument for who counts to be who counts as a person, who counts as a human. And finally, we can't separate these aspects from the idea that European liberalism, as it is laid out in these texts, amounts to something like the legitimate legitimacy for a massive global land grab, and which is, is played out through colonialism. So let me move on here. And again, I apologize for the noise in the background. This is just the house in, in the evening. So to kind of bring things together for a moment, um, we are going to be looking briefly at three seminal texts in European classic uh, liberal philosophy. And those texts are The Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes. Um, the second is Two Treaties on Government by John Locke. And the third is The Discourse on Inequality by Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, to think about the link between these philosophies and colonialism, I want to emphasize one, how the evocation of a state of nature produces a perspective that divides the world into two main groups. On the one hand, we have European world, the European world of white men who have lifted themselves out of the hypothetical state of nature by virtue of their reason or other faculties of civilization. And on the other side, we have the rest of the world that's inhabited by the less than human savages who do not have the capacity, capacity it seems, to, to elevate themselves to the level of the social contract and civilization. They can only do so, claim these texts, under the guidance of white European male civilization. So the state of nature, and this is the second point, lays out an idea of property that legitimizes colonial settler land grabs. And in so doing, it enables what we could think of as the idea of manifest destiny, which is the notion that settling of other places, particularly North America, was inevitable and a God-given right of white people. And it's a very dangerous doctrine that we still see um, active in other parts of the world. So let's start with um, Hobbes and Locke. And this is gonna be a little bit of a sort of a crash course for people who are unfamiliar with these texts. I have to read these every year <laughs> as part of my my contractual engagement with the University of Chicago, which I like actually, because I actually like coming back to these texts and I always find something new in them. And, um, but they are texts that present certain difficulties and at least with, with the language and other aspects. But um, so this will be somewhat of a crash course and, and uh, yeah, um, yeah, it, it's fun for me to kind of lay it out in, in, this, in this sort of setting that's very different from the classes that I, that I teach. So it's important to know the historical context in which Hobbes and Locke were writing. This is a time when Europe's European society was coming out of feudalism and taking its first steps toward building um, a political theory to support claims of legitimate authority and ideas of autonomy, that is self-governance. Hobbes, who I, I think it was it showed before, uh, uh, he lived from 1588 to 1679, was greatly influenced by the political upheaval of the English Civil War, 
And this is represented, this is the best painting I could find of the English Civil War. Again, there are lots of them on the internet. And this, this is unabashedly lifted from the internet. This is by Abraham Co um, Cooper. It's a picture of the English Civil War. So what exactly was the English Civil War? And this is gonna be a slight digression, but it's, it, you know, it's, it's important to know the history in the end because it's somewhat of a state of nature. So the English Civil War, um, uh, some put it as the beginning of uh, an era of revolutions in which the feudal systems were replaced with emerging forms of government. Uh, the English Civil War was in some sense a kind of temporary experiment in the doing away of, of monarchy, doing away of, of the king, an attempt to sort of think about what, what actual sovereignty by the people would look like. Uh, just for the particulars, the war was between 1642 and 1651, so right sort of in the middle of when colonialism was taking off in Europe. And in it, the parliamentarians fought against the royalists and then to take down child, uh, King Charles I. However, there are many configurations of this struggle, but in the end, the parliamentarians with a new model army, uh, I guess it's a new kind of modern army, established the first Commonwealth of England. And this gave way to the protectorate under Oliver Cromwell between 1653 and 1658. Now, King Charles I was executed, uh, but his son, Charles II, who had fled, was eventually asked to return in 1660 to reestablish the monarchy. And that's why I say it's a temporary experiment with getting away with, uh, with doing away with the monarchy, because it didn't last very long. Um, that's why the experiment in forming the Commonwealth was to some extent a failure. It did set up a relationship between the king and the parliament that served a, as a limit on the sovereign's power and sort of an initial experiment in what would eventually be constitutional monarchy. So it's an important moment in this, in this phase of Europe's becoming. Now, the second main event is the so-called Glorious Revolution of 1688. Now, this is happening in the time that John Locke is writing his text. The start of this conflict goes back to Charles II, who died in 1685 and was succeeded by James II, uh, the other surviving son of Charles I, if you remember him from the previous slide. His rule was undermined by suspicions of close ties to France and his seeming um, support of the pro-Catholic groups. So when the conflict reached its height, members of the noble population asked his Protestant nephew, William of Orange, to lead an army in from the Dutch Republic in 1688, which led to, the James, to James II fleeing and the so-called Glorious Revolution. It wasn't really a revolution, it's more like, you know, uh, a reform, like, you know, the major revolution is kind of like a major reform. It's kind of a, a revolution in, in only in scare quotes only. Anyways, uh, William married his first cousin, William and Ma uh, Mary, and hence, you know, the William and Mary name. Uh, and the two reigned until 1694. Now, as I said earlier, these events are important since this is the world in which Hobbes and Locke were writing and the world in which they're trying to think about the nature of man um, and, uh, and, and the nature of society. Now Hobbes will publish the Leviathan in 1651 toward the end of the English Civil War and Locke will publish his two treaties in 1689 at the end of the Glorious Revolution. Um, unfortunately, at the end of the revolution that he meant to actually legitimize with his text, but it's another story. Now, each of these conflicts deeply inflects the formulation of the state of nature and the conditions that they lay down for the social contract. Again, my point is go in going through this is not just to say something about the philosophy of European liberalism, but also to show how it sets up a worldview that delineates clearly between a civilized Europe and an uncivilized remainder of the world, that is the rest of the world, thus creating a rationale behind colonialism. So let's start with Hobbes. Hobbes, as I said, was born in 1588. Uh, he was forced into political exile in 1640 by, um, by political strife. And the Leviathan, he wrote very quickly uh, in, in, during, his, um, during that, uh, in under a year. And that's part of the reason why the book is really hard to read. There's a lot of really poor phrasing, a lot of um, repetition. And it's, it's not a great literary text, but it has some great ideas in it. Uh, the book clearly comes out of his concern for the, over the war and his concern for the violence of political breakdown. And the dread of political collapse really runs deep throughout the text. But most importantly, Hobbes was an enlightenment thinker par excellence. And for Hobbes, as an enlightenment thinker, it wasn't, that what, it wasn't just that God was dead, but rather that God had stopped talking to man. So we didn't know if God was dead or not. 
Thus, a fundamental question was how can human beings develop a legitimate system of political authority on their own, born of the imminent authority of society, society itself? Now, in some ways, we can see this question played out in the title and the iconography of the cover of the text. The title, The Leviathan, or Matter, Form, and Power, which I'll come back to, or the Commonwealth, Ecclesiastical, and Civil, which I'll come back to in a moment. Um, uh, uh, and then the second part of the title and the iconography of the title, um, you can see that the, the sovereign, because Hobbes is going to give us the idea of, a, of the great absolute sovereign power, the sovereign whose body is made up of a bunch of little bodies of people, if you look closely at the picture, he's holding in one hand the sword, in one hand the scepter of the church. So, and then the um, images on the one side match the images on the other. So the images are on the, on the, will be the, the left side for you, I guess, because you're looking at the screen, are all images that relate to military power. And the images on the right are all images that relate to um, transcendent power of the church, where they align with his, with his, with his, uh, the scepter. So in bringing these two things together, the, power, the sovereign is bringing, to, together, bringing together the, the imminent power of the military, but also the transcendent power of the church in order to form the legitimate authority. So in other words, Hobbes wants to develop a political governance that derives from the contract among men. And there's a power of governance that is, as I said, imminent to the people. And yet he, he can't quite give up the need to have that power anchored in a transcendental authority. So he's, he's trying to navigate two different kinds of worlds there. Um, the appeal to transcendence is also, as we'll say, appeal, an appeal to universal truth, which Hobbes claims to be doing in this text, which we'll, we'll see in, in the first part of the text in a moment. So um, onto another uh, slightly, slightly diversion, but important aspect of the text is the cover title of the Leviathan, which is, uh, as I said, uh, the Leviathan, or means it's another title for it, matter, form, power of commonwealth, ecclesiastical, and civil. Now talking about matter, form, and power may seem like a really strange way to start a political theory. And it is indeed, we don't imagine people doing that today. But we, we have to recall that as an enlightenment thinker, Hobbes doesn't want to just propose a philosophy of governance, but rather wants to govern, wants to ground that philosophy in an objective scientific truth. In other words, Hobbes sees himself as, a, as, a, as writing a science of political theory. It's not just political theory, it's science. He sees himself as doing science. And this is important since it works on a rhetorical level to qualify his description of a state of nature and as, an, as an attempt to provide an empirical description of the world. So he thinks he's doing an actual empirical study of human beings. Now this is made uh, especially clear in the first part of the text, in the first part is called Of Man, where Hobbes tries to lay out an objective theory of the senses uh, and knowledge. Now Hobbes, like Aristotle, thought that knowledge was derived from the senses. This is a big debate at this time, but had a different idea. So Aristotle believed that every physical object has an essence or a substance, like clay model of a tree and a real tree share a similar form, but they have radically different substance. And from that, that essential quality, the, the essential substantial, substantial quality of a thing, you get the real name. So there's a kind of indexical relationship between words and a transcendental truth, uh, a sort of a, a metaphysical reality that, that Hobbes, is, no, sorry, that Aristotle is pointing to. So there's a sort of diagram of truth that lies behind the real for, for Aristotle that gives, that gives order to the world. But Hobbes, by contrast, he doesn't agree with this. Um, uh, Hobbes was, was a nominalist, meaning that he doesn't believe that the concept of essence is useful for explaining our relationship with the world and our sensory uh, experience. He believes that the only things worth talking about are matter and its interactions. Therefore, his account of how we obtain knowledge through the senses has to rely on the interaction between matter. Accordingly, information to the information you get from the senses is just a bunch of particles bouncing off your sensory organs. So he's going to say um, this in the first aspect. You, you can see this in the first chapter, in the first chapter where Hobbes tries to lay out a kind of mechanics for the way in which we understand the world with the idea that the material world presses on our senses. Now I'm not gonna read this, but you can see that from the first, sense, first, science, first sentence here, um, this is taken from the text. 
the cause of sense is the external body or object with, with, which presseth on the organ to each sense. And he's going to go on and describe this whole thing as a kind of motion in the world that causes life and life as, as things that are put in motion, motion that presses on the senses and creates a, 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 a sensory regime that we know as the world, right? Now, importantly, um, according to Hobbes, information to the senses is really unreliable. There's no master metaphysical plan, as was, there was for uh, Aristotle, that provides the ununifying meaning of terms. Science cannot begin, therefore, before we clarify the meaning of our terms, the precise meaning of language. Accordingly, accordingly we need to spend time carefully tweaking the information we get from the senses to make sure we have it right. And we need to be hyper-objective in our descriptions, which means not using metaphors, not using all these sort of fancy words and, and, and flowery phrases that he doesn't like, right? Now, making matters even worse, and I'm putting the pieces from the text here that, that actually show this, is that, um, is, that it's the, is that all men are different. It's not only that all men are different, and really these texts are only about men, unfortunately, um, that's what they're talking about, but also that people are changing all the time. So our sensory regime is changing all the time, right? So we have no real unified way of understanding the world. So what I want to underscore, underscore here is the way in which this is a sensory model of epistemology, which claims to be offering not an interpretation of the world, but rather an objective description of an empirical reality. Accordingly, Hobbes spends an exceedingly amount of time, exceeding amount of time in the first chapters defining what we mean by speech, reason, science, imagination, and so on. It's an exhaustive clarification of terms as a preamble to his political science. As I said before, it's a attempt to make political theory into political science, right? So this is important since when Hobbes tells us about the state of nature, we need to understand that he's claiming to represent an empirical reality, not just something that, that may or may not. It's not just a philosophical experiment for him, it's a real world. So this real world has real repercussions because it, it sets up a worldview for how Europeans will, will, will view the world. So what does Hobbes say about the state of nature? Hobbes is going to say that um, the state of nature is not a very nice situation to be in, which is clearly informed, of course, by his experience in the English Civil War. The reason is that it's not a nice situation is because of three conditions, and this is a, a, it's a condition of war, and the conditions are because of um, man's competition, his diffidence, which is sort of insecurity here, and his need for glory. Now, the upshot is, and this is probably the most famous part of Hobbes' text is that, um, where is it? The, uh, uh, the man is in a perpetual state of war. Um, and this is what Hobbes, uh, 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 for Hobbes, the state of, uh, this is what he's going to describe here as a war of such uh, as every man against every man. It's everyone for themselves. It's a total, uh, total chaos, state of war. People are in this, this incredibly permanent uh, um, state of radical insecurity because no one can trust everyone. Everybody's trying to kill everybody. It's a bad place to be. You don't want to be in the state of nature. For, so for Hobbes, this, the, uh, this state of nature, this state of savagery and war ends only um, with the foundation of a social contract that establishes the reign of the sovereign who keeps everybody in place because it's this figure of fear and awe. And fear is the sort of the underlying political technology for, for Hobbes. Now the social contract is an agreement of every man with every other man to give absolute obedience to the sovereign, who then provides a state of absolute security uh, that ends the condition of permanent war. Now the seemingly important and paradoxical part of this text for us is that right after describing the state of nature, Hobbes is going to tell us that there, there that there was probably never a state of nature, but there currently is a state of nature. And this is where it becomes very unclear. He's going to say, but there are many places where it may peradventure be thought that there never was such a time or condition of war as this, a state of nature. And I believe it was never generally so all over the world. Therefore, it's just a thought experiment, right? No problem, it's just a philosophical thought experiment. But there are many places where they live so now. In other words, it's not a thought experiment. For the savages, the savage people in many places of America have no government at all and live at this day in, in the brutish manner, as I said before. So therefore the state of nature is a hypothetical thing that never existed in Europe, yet still exists in the rest of the world, right? And so we have civilization, they don't. <laughs> 
basically is what he's saying. In short, we can see how um, Hobbes' claim to an empirical description construct, construct, constructs a perception of the world as the West versus the rest. And while the West, meaning Western Europe, has the capacity to bring itself or bootstrap itself, we might say, out of the state of nature, and in fact already has in Hobbes' book, the rest of the world remains in a savage state, awaiting the arrival of European white men and true civilization. Okay, so how about Locke? Now to start, Locke offers us uh, a very different view of human nature from the state of nature. This is because Locke is not writing out of concern for the fundamental insecurity wrought by war, but rather to provide rationale or, uh, for rebellion, he stops just, or just short of, of revolution. Essentially, Locke was concerned with attempts by the crown to confiscate property. So instead of arguing for absolute authority like Hobbes, he, he argues for actual limits on government. The, the government that governs best is one that, that governs the, the least in some ways. And he'll do so by making property, reason, economy, something that exists within the state of nature prior to actual society. Now the social contract for him becomes then a way to secure the rights that he claims that man already had in the state of nature, which we see in the first quote, right? Um, what this, this state of nature. Uh, to understand the political power and derive from its original, we must consider the, with what state all men are naturally in, and that is a state of perfect freedom in their actions. They can dispose of their possessions as they think fit, and they can do things to, uh, without having to depend on any other man. And Locke really, it's interesting to see, he's, Locke is, is the, the, the strongest influence in, in, American, in American constitution, you might say. And it's in a way, I think, how we end up with the sort of the perverse individualism of America is kind of a, a, a complete misinterpretation of Locke as, as, as legitimizing a kind of um, absolute individualism at the, at, the, at the expense of autonomy. So as we see here anyways, he describes the state of nature in very different terms as a state of equality, as a state of peace, goodwill, mutual assistance, and preservation. That's the second quote here. It's of men living together according to reason without common superior on earth with authority to judge between them is properly the state of nature, right? So it's very different from Hobbes' state of nature. And this is, you know, the texts aren't that far apart. Now, again, like Hobbes, we see Locke um, anticipating the reader's question whether the state of nature is real or whether it's just a philosophical device. But Locke makes clear here in similar ways that um, there are places in the world that do have contracts, but not all those contracts are equal to what he's going to call the social contract in true civilization. So um, uh, not the, therefore, not all those contracts are going to be ones that take the human, that take civilization out of the savage state and put it into a state of nature and put it into a true civil society. So he'll say, for it is not every compact that puts an end to the state of nature between man, but only this one of agreeing together mutually to enter into one community and make one body politic. Other promises and compacts may make men one uh, men with one another, and yet still be in a state of nature. So the other people may have a kind of society, but that society doesn't qualify as proper civilization because it's not a European civilization with what Locke defines as as the true notion of the social contract. And he also makes uh, oh, am I here? Um, uh, clear that these non-European peoples may have something like society, but as I said, it's not the true society. Okay, so it's a very different uh, framing. So respond, uh, Locke is going to respond to um, the idea that the state of nature is going to respond again, that it may just be a, a mere fiction that we're thinking of and imposing on the rest of the world. And he cites Hooker, who is uh, another thinker of the time who he likes to, to cite a lot in his text, who suggests um, that humans will naturally form social units in, other, in order to provide certain necessities of life. But Locke is going to double down on his initial claim that we saw in the text before, uh, to say that men remain in the state of nature until they lift themselves up through a social contract. Uh, it is worth noting here the implicit notion that it is only European white men who really have the capacity to lift themselves out because it's only the European white men whose state of nature has what Locke will say is reason and economy and also property, as we'll see in a moment. 
And so he says here, but I moreover affirm that all men are naturally in a state of nature and remain so till they're by their own consents, they make themselves members of some political society. So only Europe has done this for Locke. The rest of the world has not and will not. And that's an important part. So um, the notion of a hypothetical state of nature for Europe and real state of nature for the rest of the world is one aspect in Locke's work that rationalizes European treatment of the other people in the world as less than human because they don't qualify because they're still in a savage state. But we can say though that a far more nefarious rationale for European colonialism comes from Locke's theory of property, which we should, which we should also note um, is reiterated by Rousseau. And I'm not gonna bring this part up in Rousseau, but it, we should, it's there if anybody wants to look at it. Now, it's really important to pay attention to the wording in which Locke lays out his theory of property, because he starts by, by saying that God gave all the world to men, which would seem to say that no one has any specific claim to land or property. He says, God hath given the world to men in common, hath also given them reason to make use of it to the best advantage of life and convenience. The earth and all that is therein is given to men for the support and comfort of their being. Wow, seems really good. People can, everybody can use the earth, that's fine. So God gives the earth, but he's not using the term property yet. So property becomes something very different. So then he goes on to qualify this. Yeah, um, and he suggests the idea that since labor is a form of individual property, it's only when one mixes one labor, mixes one's labor with land, that land actually becomes property, right? And he says here, the labor of his body and the work of his hands, this is the second quote here, we may say are properly his. Whatsoever then he removes out of the state of nature, hath provided and left it in, he hath mixed his labor with and joined it to something that his own, and thereby make it his property. So the, the world lies out there, and by working the land, you make it yours. All right, and that's the theory of property. That's how you come to own property. You just grab a piece of land and you start working it and you make it yours. So that's his theory there of property. And we can see where that probably leads to a lot of problems. Now Locke goes on to suggest that whatever a man manages to remove from the commons by virtue of his mixing of labor with that thing also makes it his property. So it's not just in the state of nature, it's anything that is in the commons of people that any society may be using, so the commons of human beings, if you remove that, you're making it your property. You can just go take what you want from the commons. Now, we should also note here as well that he states explicitly that it does not matter if one has the consent of others to do this. In other words, working the land just means it's yours. And he says here, um, we see in commons which remains so compact that it is taking part of what is common and removing it out of the state of nature, leaves in which the state of nature leaves in, which begins the property without which common is of no use. And taking of this or that part does not depend on the express consent of all commoners. So it doesn't matter what they say, you grab it, you start working it, it's yours. Now we can see where that probably lends itself to a lot of problems um, that we can call America. So what is important is that the first quotation here that I put, um, that Locke seems to suggest that there, uh, at a different point in the text, he seems to suggest that there should be a limit on how much can one can actually take from the world. Um, that he says here that uh, you should only take as much as you can actually uh, use before it spoils. So that his labor can, you, your, your property should only be mixed, your labor should only be mixed with that which you can actually use. And whatever is beyond this, it belongs to others. Now that seems really good, right? Um, and that seems like it, it has a, a very beneficial aspect that the lack is placing a kind of limit on, on what property ownership, ownership should be. And it's very much scaled down to what you can work. But this becomes problematic in, in other parts of the text that I just, I don't think I have time to, to bring out here is that he also eventually suggests that with the advent of the money economy, it's okay to take as much as you want, as long as you change whatever might spoil into money, therefore securing your, um, securing your, your sorry, so therefore securing your, your goods so that, so that you can transfer your ownership, your property into actual money. Therefore, he lifts the limit on what you can actually own and says that you can make as much as you want into your property. Therefore, we, it's, it's a sort of capitalism without limits at this point, right? And that's really important. 
Now in the second section here that I that I have up, we find what is ultimately the final rationale behind manifest destiny. And this is the idea that land that is not being cultivated through labor in order to produce value through property is land that is not being properly used according to God's wishes. Such land stands waiting as it were, uh, as an open frontier waiting to be made into proper property through Western labor. And he'll say, he gave it to those, God, gave it to those, uh, to those, to, sorry, he gave it to the use of the industrious and the rational. And labor was to be his title to it, not to the fancy covetousness of the quarrelsome and the contentious, meaning those who are still in a state of labor. Therefore, it is a God-given um, necessity to go out and, and take land and make it useful. And so um, finally, just in case we miss any of this, Locke is going to say something similar to what Hobbes has said. Um, he's going to say it again, that once upon a time, there was a state of nature, and that state of nature looks very much like contemporary America for Locke, so the Locke's contemporary times. He'll say, thus in the beginning, all the world was America, and more so than it is now. Therefore, America remains in the state of, I don't know what these philosophers have with, the, with America, but they're very focused on America at that time. And America being this, this, this place that's, that's eliciting um, our colonial intervention. And they're rationalizing it in all these different ways by saying it's still in a state of nature. We need to go save it and civilize uh, the others. Okay. I'm trying to go on here. Okay, so finally, how about Rousseau? Now, Rousseau's position in relation to colonialism is a bit more difficult to understand since he's a more subtle philosopher and theorist than, the, than Hobbes or Locke. And, and I gotta admit, I like Rousseau more. It's, it's funner to read Rousseau. I always get the class excited. Uh, Rousseau begins almost to sound like Marx at certain points, but he's not because he doesn't have the you know, aspects, but he does have a kind of theory of dialectic, which is really interesting. Um, anyways, uh, Rousseau begins by admitting that it is really impossible to know anything about a state of nature. He sees it as a kind of epistemic limit, absolutely unknowable. Um, uh, nevertheless, he suggests that it is something about which we must know. He says it is impossible to know correctly a state of which no longer exists, which perhaps never did exist, which probably never will exist, and about which nevertheless it is necessary to have correct notions in order to judge our present state of prop of, of uh, in order to judge our present state properly. Therefore, it never existed, probably doesn't exist, and never will exist. But we have to know about it; otherwise, we can't know what we're in, what situation we're in right now. So he's sort of in a, a paradoxical moment here. Um, now, where Hobbes rested the claim to be doing science uh, in order to know the state of nature. Uh, and the nature of man and Locke uh, appeals to the Bible, parts I can read. Rousseau, by contrast, appeals to philosophy and the possibility of doing a kind of thought experiment um, and almost a kind of speculative fiction. And this is why I like Rousseau. Uh, speculative fiction in order to think about what might have been in the state of nature. And so Rousseau gets uh, pretty interesting at this point. Oh, I gotta reduce the screen here. Okay. Um, and where are we here? Um, he'll say that uh, what experiments he'll ask at this point, what experiments would be necessary in order to gain knowledge of natural man, and what are the means for doing these experiments in the midst of society? I'll go on here. And here um, he makes the claim, which is key to his argument, and which others have written about. Um, the nature of man, a key to his argument about, about, uh, about others uh, having written about the nature of man and the state of nature is defined by competition and conflict, which is how the way Hobbes defined it, or by reason and economy, which is the way that, that Locke defined it. Um, and here that the Rousseau makes his, his most important argument about the state of nature um, that is part of his overall rhetoric. And in short, he's going to say that um, Where's the part? Uh, so he says, in short, all of them, meaning Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, uh, sorry, Hobbes and Locke and others, all of them speaking continually of need, greed, oppression, desires, and pride, have carried into the state of nature ideas that they have taken from society. Thus, they spoke of savage man when they were actually depicting civil man. Right, so he, this is a very different view. He's going to say, actually, all those things that that, that Hobbes said about society, that Locke said about society, about the state of nature, all those things were actually 
aspects of society, not really the state of nature. So he's gonna give us the true notion of the state of nature. So in contrast to Hobbes and Locke, Rousseau, Hobbes and Locke Rousseau describes man in the state of nature as wandering alone in a kind of blissful state of ignorance, content to be alone, strong and healthy and without any needs or wants in the world. So for Rousseau, um, so far, it seems then, in other words, and Rousseau seems to be moving away from the kind of discourse we've seen with Hobbes and Locke, in which Europe was somehow, uh, uh, somehow, Europe, Europe was somehow uh, able to move away from its mythical state of nature to become civilized while the rest of the world remains in the real state of nature. Moreover, the state of nature doesn't seem so bad in Rousseau, in Rousseau's writing. Rather, for Rousseau, it's civilization that is bad. Right? Well, the state of nature is actually a place of, of the noble savage. Civilization for Rousseau is a place of inequality before it gets the, the social, contra, social contract. Um, but this, is, this would be a, a simplistic reading. And this is where many people often misread Rousseau as having said that um, they read him in all sort of uh, Emerson Thoreau kind of ways. Rousseau saying that you know, we should all go back to nature and that nature was this wonderful notion of place of this nimble savage. But he's, he's actually, he's not gonna say that at all. He's gonna say something very different. Um, since his ultimate argument is that the evolution from a state of nature uh, to society is an accident, but it's a very necessary accident. And that accident leads to an initial state of, initial kind of society that is marked, as I said, by kind of rampant inequality and badness. Um, but with that, that in a society of inequality will ultimately set the stage for the possibility of a legitimate and moral political authority, authority through a proper social contract. Um, sorry, I'm getting my text. So what I want to emphasize is that it is this combination of accident of something being an accident but necessary that is critical since it describes a particular set of conditions which Rousseau finds only in Europe, meaning that only Europe in Rousseau's thinking has the unique conditions to undergo the evolution from the state of nature into a proper and legitimate social form. So this is kind of a particular discord, uh, 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 what will we say today, a sort of a discourse of, of, of European exceptionalism in Rousseau's thinking. And we'll see later in the text when Rousseau is writing about the rise of the arts uh, and metallurgy and agriculture, which he sees as the founding but accidental moment, a kind of revolution as it were, that brought forth economy and inequality as the first stage of European society. Now he makes the claim that these two critical arts were and remain unknown to the savages of America, right? He says, accordingly, both of them were unknown to the savages of America, who for this reason have always remained savage. Again, these guys really have it in for America, right? Now going on, he also makes the rise of civilization in the same text here. He makes the rise of civilization in Europe contingent on the acquisition of both of these arts, not just one, right? He'll say, and perhaps uh, uh, in his, um, from here, um, right, in, in, in contingent on both of these arts. He says other peoples have remained, uh, even though they practice only one of these arts, right, in the second sentence there. Now in the last sentence, in this, which is the final part of this argument here, that I'm gonna to present um, to you in this, in this aspect of Rousseau, is that uh, Europe's realization of civilization in Rousseau's thinking ultimately comes down to a kind of um, auspicious geography, a sort of a, a positioning in the world. He writes, and perhaps one of the chief reasons why Europe has been civilized, if not earlier than at least more continuously more than other parts of the world, is that it is at the same time the most abundant in iron and the most fertile in wheat. So it's iron and wheat for him, which are very important for enabling the first moments of, of, of real civilization that move us out of the, the, the state of inequality towards social and uh, social discourse. Discourse. In other words, Europe has a special geograph geographical and cultural conditions. Only Europe has a special geographical and cultural conditions to really lead the state of nature. Now, it's worth adding that Rousseau ultimately makes the case that savage man in the state of nature is so far from man in society that it is simply impossible for the latter to know the former. There's sort of incommensurable ways of being. What he's trying to say here is that human beings are changing creatures. 
that there is that there is that there is no um, what should we say no immutable nature of man, but only a kind of uh, only kind of uh, a nature of man that is always in a state of becoming. And this is where I, this is the part of Rousseau that I actually like. Now, while this can be read in very positive terms as prioritizing a kind of ontogenesis over ontology and even over essentialism. It also has the effect of separating the world in the way that we saw before into two very distinct kinds of, a place of two different distinct kinds of beings. There are dis, um, they are so distinct in fact, as we learned earlier, that they are unrecognizable and unknowable to one another. They're one is human and the other is something else. On one side is civilized man, who is capable of change, who has been transformed and is continuously transforming into a more civilized man. On the other side, um, we have savages who have somehow been stuck in the position of being and not been able to uh, embrace the, um, the becoming that is uh, essential to European thought and European philosophy. So those people who are uh, stuck in the state of being uh, really are awaiting in Rousseau's text the arrival of European real European society to to um, realize their potential of becoming. Okay, so in concluding, I want to circle around back to where I started, which is the state of nature in the post-apocalyptic uh, science fiction. The question is whether we do any better uh, with the idea of the state of nature in this in, with this time around, um, according to these writers. Uh, and as we do, if we do any better this time with the state of nature as a kind of speculative device for thinking about how we could reboot or restart society, what would be the second chance after a post-apocalypse whereby society was totally destroyed and we had to think about starting again? So the one that I, I've actually written about in, in that was published on, with um, uh, um, uh, with Asli and and and. and um, and, uh, and uh, Casper is the children of time. And it's, it's uh, well, you can read the article, I'll tell you on the video. So in the children of time, the future remains colonial with a uh, conquering human empire. So we're very much stuck in sort of the problematics of, of colonialism that we have in contemporary society. But when this, this empire and, 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 and conquering society gets derailed, humans return to a state of nature that opens up all kinds of different possibilities. And in the state of nature at this point, human society finally evolves, but not through human beings, not through humanism, but through a, a really interesting form of multi-speciesism. And I'm not, I'm not gonna give it away for anybody who hasn't read the book. So it's an encouragement to, to go read the book. Um, and I'm gonna enable screen here. Now, in the book Commune, which is problematic for various various uh, uh, reasons, but I still really enjoyed it, and it's, uh, I think it's a four-book series, so it's, it's worth getting into. Uh, once society is destroyed by a natural event, it returns to a state of nature, and from there we follow two competing versions uh, for post-apocalyptic societies. On the one hand, there's a society organized around a kind of sovereign, it's a very sort of Hobbesian society, it has all the problems and inequalities of the pre-post-apocalyptic society. On the other hand, we have a, 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 an interesting sort of new commune community that forms out in the mountains. And it's the, the story leaves it off there and it has problems with the way the commune is, is developed, but still it's an interesting attempt to think about what society might look like in a post, in, if you could think the state of nature again. And the, the next one is Hugh Howey's trilogy, which I really like. Um, it's after the fall of civilization, where we uh, there's a, the ma a massive experiment of 50 different siloed emerging communities um, to determine which will re-inhabit the state of which will re-inhabit the the, the uh, recovered Earth. So it's it's a great story, and they don't realize they're in the silo until later in the story, and then they have to break out, and so the whole the whole plan goes awry. And it's led by a, a, a strong female character, so it's it's a really it's a fun book to read. And finally, in Semiosis, which uh, uh, Morrison uh, met the author, which came to Chicago, humans get a chance to start again in a state of nature on another planet. But unlike uh, the planet Earth, they're actually not the most intelligent or the most capable species on the planet. There's actually the, the plant life is a lot smarter. So the humans have to deal with, again, a kind of multi species uh, possibility and a uh, state of nature where they are decentered. And it's not 
humans, but human beings have to learn to get along with other forms of life. So I'm going to leave it at that. And I am just short of an hour, so I figured that's a good time. And um, I hope you enjoyed this. So I should stop sharing screen. Thank you very much. It was really, really, really great. Um, uh, I had read these texts basically 15 years ago or so when I was an under. <laughs> but then I learned so much and you refresh my memory, but also I learned so much more than what I learned in my political science class. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, and sure. um, let's perhaps go into some <coughs> comments and questions that might have. All right. Yeah, jump for a very quick bio break before we. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we can have There's a sort of break. Quick bio break before we. Okay. Um... All right then, everyone, we are gonna have a five minute break. All right. back we had a sort of five minutes break okay i know you know talking about this stuff gets a little tedious point so i hope people were, were um i hope they're okay with that and it gets a little it, for me it was really really, really awesome oh, good. Good. like as i said i learned about this stuff when i was an undergrad but then now I was like, this should have been my course 15 <laughs> years ago. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've been teaching these, I think it's 10 years now. Yeah. Every year I do this, this. But every time I come back to them, I come back to them in a different way. So mm -hmm. I'm, every time I'm, in, I'm in, informed by the other stuff that I'm reading, so I begin to see it in, in different ways. And there's a wonderful reading of... of of um, Hobbes that's done by uh, Hagar Kotev. And it's about uh, all about uh, um, uh, sort of colonial, settler colonialism in the Middle East and Hobbes' emphasis on motion. And she does a beautiful reading of, of Hobbes' text in that, in that context. <laughs> 
I really encourage anybody who's interested to follow up on this. Some of what some of what I was thinking today is taken from from Kotev. It's, it's a great book. It's really interesting. Hagar Kotev. I will look into yeah. it. It also there's always been like you know all of my research about robots and stuff. Yeah. It has always been part of like my train of thought to think about uh, this sort of uh very canonical texts in the context of is human good or bad because it's important yeah. for how we think about robots but then yeah. i saw this sort of how can i say um it's not mutually exclusive yeah in the sense yeah. that it's both good and bad and that's why where your point comes into this sort of uh like by drawing lines to who counts as human who counts as person yeah become very like impressive for me so that i will yeah think more about it because like i have always seen that it's yeah nation it's like it exists well it's, it's so like, much part of our, our it's embedded in our cultural thinking and so it's you know and it's also the idea of, of liberalism is is taken over in terms of the way in which we define the relationship with nature. And one of the aspects that I find the most problematic of all these texts is that they assume that there's a human that has a sort of ontological priority to nature. So there's like a state of nature in which there's an individual, right? There's an individual that exists in the state of nature and somehow that individual gets itself out of the state of nature. And why should the individual, which is already a, a modern notion why should that pre-exist modern society? And so it's like the way in which the individual is given a kind of ontological priority so that each text then struggles with the question of what sort of sacrifices the individual has to make for the sake of the collective. And yeah. so anything thought of in terms of for the collective becomes a sacrifice of my own rights. And we see that played out today in America with why should I wear a mask for the collective? I'm sacrificing my freedom for the collective sake of the collective, I don't want to do that, right? And like all these aspects of sort of rampant American um, uh, uh, perverse individualism come out of this idea that there's an individual and then they form a collective. So the individual always has to give something up to join the collective. Whereas if you look at like Eastern thought, there's nature, there's some sort of environment and from the environment emerges something that can be called human, can be called man, can be called like, you know, can be called uh, uh, a human being, right? So the the, the human as 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 a thing doesn't pre-exist the the environment. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting to to see how they all all these texts also struggle with it with that tension or the contradiction between the individual and the collective. And Rousseau is the one who tries to get beyond that. He has sort of like a um, for. For, for Hobbes, you transfer your rights to the sovereign, you give up your rights, the sovereign has total control, that's it. Locke, you never really have to give anything up because you, you maintain everything and you sort of always in a, in a tentative relationship of, of working, negotiating limited governance with, with the king. But Rousseau doesn't want that to happen. He wants the collective to be there. So he says, he actually forms a dialectic between freedom and contract from which you get the general will. And the general will is caused by the total alienation of the individual to everybody else, and therefore you get the general will. But it, despite that, all of the texts ultimately come down on the side of the collective over the individual. And yet when you read American theory today, it's all about the individual over the collective. So America like reverses all the priorities of the text, but still we're at this problem of why do, why do we have to go back to the state of nature to think about this idea of the individual versus collective? Why can't we think of, of the individual as, as not having ontological priority with, with, with an environment? Because the environment comes first and then we come, right? So we should think of those terms. So all these texts are deeply flawed in that. And it's really problematic that liberalism can't get past this idea of the individual because it's such a harmful notion. Yeah. Sorry, it's my other spiel about the state of nature. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so I suppose now we can go into questions part of this meeting or comments. Yeah, or well, just open talk, yeah. James. James, you're still muted, I think. You're muted. We see your lips moving, but we can't hear you. I need to work on my lip syncing. 
that uh, the breathing. <laughs> we cannot hear you. Okay, try try rebooting Skype. Ah, uh, Skype, uh, Zoom. Okay, we'll come back. Maybe All right, I could even chat. In, or yeah, anyone else for now? You can write it in the chat, James, so that we can read it. Tatsuma? Yes. Still muted. Okay, there we go. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. Hi. Oh, hi. Um, thank you for this very interesting uh, presentation and analysis. Um, well, I, I found especially interesting uh, the fact that you you connected this emergence of uh, idea of exceptionality uh, of the European white man to, let's say, the great divide uh, of modernity between human, between society and nature. Um, and I, I found this uh, link uh, uh, very uh, insightful. Um, and also because uh, uh, one of the authors you, you, you analyzed, Hobbes, is one of the uh, two protagonists of uh, uh, We Have Never Been Modern of Latour. Right, that's uh, true, that's right, yeah. And, and the other protagonist being uh, Robert Boyle, who was actually born uh, not far away from here in County Waterford, right, right. As, as James oh, said. Sorry, Leviathan in the air pump, right? Yeah. And yes, so uh, the idea, uh, uh, each, each carving, uh, let's say, uh, respectively, a place for society and a place for nature as two separate entities. Um, so one first uh, question slash uh, point of discussion might be, uh, in the case, bringing in uh, the figure of Robert Boyle, or perhaps more in general, uh, we know uh, the uh, Royal Society and uh, development of modern scientific discourse. Uh, one first question might be uh, how, um, besides political theory, how uh, the development of uh, science, the evolution of, of scientific thought uh, um, was used or, or perhaps uh, uh, affected also the development of uh, colonialist, yeah. uh, yeah. colonialist thought. And, and I have a second question, um, <coughs> observation, uh, concerning instead uh, Locke. Um, so, uh, because um, it's, there's an interesting uh, comment made by Poricor uh, concerning Locke, John Locke, because according to Ricoeur, um, the, yeah, um, we might say that um, um, the separation between uh, body and mind uh, was uh, uh, discussed by through the cogito ergo sum already uh, in France, but uh, um, by uh, Descartes, but uh, it was only with Locke that uh, actually took a particular form uh, of reflexivity and identity. And, and uh, because they, there was a, a clear difference between Descartes' notion of, uh, of separation between bo uh, body and mind and, and the one instead advanced by Locke, because uh, differently from Locke, uh, Descartes didn't have any notion of memory in the subject. So it was a kind of uh, flashbulb, flash uh, intuition, flash intuition of identity, instantaneous, of a, sorry, of a, a thinking. Memory, I think. Yeah. Uh, instantaneous, while in the lock case, there was reflexivity, uh, memory, and therefore uh, the idea of identity, identity, and uh, through a separation of body and mind. So it, it was much uh, more defined in, in law. So I, I, I like to bring in also the philosophy because you, you said perhaps 
it's it's not really only in philosophy, but I think uh, philosophy did play uh, an important role in the development of of uh, uh, colonialism. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's a really good point. I think I think science is you know the whole the whole mission of natural history to form a sort of taxonomic representation of the world and the idea and this goes back to what a lot of other people have said that that europe has is that europe has the only access to universal truths and they have access to universal truths by the abstract the the the, the work of abstraction through modern science and that being a particular kind of science that gives it a kind of um gives European truth a priority to other forms of truth. And the way that that truth is laid out, I think that, that, that you know, Leviathan the Air Pump, for example, does a really good, 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 um, uh, good work in showing it how those truths uh, have uh, become institutionally situated and how those institutions then lend sort of authority to the production of these truths. And that's the whole mission of of modern science to be to to form universals. That's how we get you know the elementary forms of this and the elementary forms of that, right? Because it's all about that modern moment of, of finding those universals around the world that therefore give Europe the right to define the rest of the world as particular. And so you know the work that's been done by by people recently to sort of the particularization of Europe and showing how that science itself is is a kind of particularization. So I think that, that that's really important to, to point that out. You know, the other aspect is that, you know, your the notion of nature and culture that, that's put, that's that's brought up in the text here through the idea of society, uh, the idea of, 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 of um, state of nature, that nature culture line is constantly being redefined and constantly moving through all these texts. And each time that nature and culture is defined, it's always def redefined in political terms in ways that foreclose political possibilities for other people, but enable political possibilities for others. So it's always working to sort of, in Europe's favor, to enable political possibilities for Europe while, while, while disenfranchising other people in the world as in the way that we see in this text here. So that the sort of the very malleability of the nature culture line. So it's not like we get a firm boundary between nature and culture. We get one that's always being moved but in Europe's favor, right? And so it's really interesting to see that constantly being worked out and receiving kind of institutional authority through, through modes of you know, peer review, modes of what is science, you know, institutions, the whole movement of universalism. Uh, the other stuff, body and mind, um, it goes back to I me, mean, Locke has other ways. I'm only dealing with the, the two treaties. And so it's a very narrow set of texts that it deals with the state of nature. But again, it's this effort to define, define what is the human. I, and I think that 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 this idea of of putting the human as 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 a particular kind of human that that does a particular sort of rational labor, that it can be the only human, and that is used as we see later on to make a distinction in Europe between men and, and women. And so Mary Wollstonecraft will say like, it's not only men who can reason; women can reason too. You know, you know, it's like this. Why don't we have education too? We're perfectly capable of reasoning, but men only have this, this, this sort of this, this capacity to make this division between body and mind, and therefore do the work of categorization in science and transcendence, right? The sort of the, the, the production of culture is sort of this transcendent symbols to control the world. So, and the rest of the world is left uh, isolated and women included, isolated in, in, in working with imminence until we get someone like Simone de Beauvoir who actually says, well, you know, imminence is ontology and ontology is really cool. So why don't we talk about materiality and things in a really cool way and talk about, you know, talk about lived worlds rather than sort of abstract worlds. And so there's a turnaround that happens there that, you know, that's really interesting. And I would actually go back, I know there's a slight divergence, I would actually go back to you know, the whole ontological turn. You could go back to people like Simone de Beauvoir and her notion of imminence in science and a way of knowing through imminence as a kind of movement towards the ontological turn, which I think is always sort of interesting to think about. I don't know if that answers Thank a very you. broad sort of answer. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Tatsuma. Okay, we have a couple of questions in the chat box. Michael, can you see the chat box? Yeah. And it takes me a while to read, so. <laughs> okay. I, I can re read it. Oh, um, no, it's okay. Okay, you. Yeah. How and when did these liberal thoughts become hegemonic in Europe? Hmm. Thinking about European ethnic diversity and different worldviews. And did this idea of white men cross ethnic prejudices within Europe? 
as for the example with respect to the populations of Portugal and Spain? That's a really good question. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to put a sort of golden stake in the ground of where these became hegemonic. I think the fact that these philosophies become ingrained into the ingrained into the actual political text that become part of the political thinking whereby Europe forms its 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 notions of sovereignty, and so I think it's 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 woven into the fundamental notions of sovereignty and and individualism in in European liberal thought, and so I don't think there's a particular. I think it's it's you know it's a kind of discourse networks that has the the. That operates everywhere, all at the same time. You know, it's in the literature, it's in it's in it's in you know, the everyday literature. So I think it's pervasive throughout. And did it cross ethnic prejudices within Europe? I don't know. That's a really good question. Um, I mean, Portugal and Spain. Obviously, Spain had its colonial missions, but they were uh, they were very different from from the french and english missions right the the french were on the mission to civilize the world supposedly and the english were on the mission to sort of control and extract value where the the spanish from what i know of the sort of the conquering of south america it was pretty much uh, a massive exploitation for for wealth and I think that the devastation of the populations down there showed the complete lack of concern for the health of the population, other than the fact that they can continue mining gold for them. And I think that was sort of their, their main aspect. I mean, the devastation wrought on the rest of the world uh, from the Spanish uh, conquer, uh, con um, uh, colonial project is, is, is larger, but those projects, Portugal and Spain precede that height of European, the 1600s, the height of European colonialism that really then defines the modern era, right? Because that's a colonialism that lays the grounds for, for the exploitative plantation exploitation. It's the colonialism that, that's, that, that, that uh, the Haitian revolution will fight against. It's the colonialism that, that lays the ground for the, the birth of the modern metropole, right? And I think uh, Morita Sensei will, will, will work this out more with, with sugar and how sugar becomes a very important aspect of, of that kind of colonialism. So I think this is, there's a colonialism we, we tend to put into one, you know, one large picture, but there are different phases with different missions and I think different ways of, of, of treating the other that are um, treating the rest of the world. So I've tried to really talk about that part that starts around the 1600s, 1700s, which is really, as I showed before on the graph, a really high moment of colonialism. But that's the moment where the world is, is, is for me, is, is made to be part of a capitalist, a capitalist system. You know, the book that we're reading next week for the class is, is uh, The Black Jacobins by C.L.R. James. And that is, is, is a book that says very clearly that colonialism and slavery is not antithetical to a European liberal project. It's very much at the heart of it. And so it's, and it's at the heart of it because of class. And so in a book that actually puts um, uh, subjects, uh, subjugates, uh, sub, uh, sorry, I'm losing at the end of the day here. It really puts the question of class uh, above the class, the question of race, particularly because of, of colonialism and capitalism at the time. So I think the relationship between colonialism and capitalism is one that gets uh, uh, um, uh, really worked out in the 1600s. Um, the next question, uh, did that, uh, was it Clarissa Resch? Ah, okay. Um, I wanted to ask about Heidegger's standing reserve is demarcation of modernity, yet what appeared to me from your reading of these authors is that the ontological inferiority of that which is external to us is far more deeply embedded in European history. And these authors are trying to mitigate the paradox of this through some forms of political collectivity and rationalizing, racializing, uh, uh, other is nature, to be mined and, fr and framed and farmed as rightful property. Yeah, just as, just some thoughts. I was looking for comments. Yeah, I mean the Heidegger Standing Reserve again is the is the later moment of capitalism when he's talking about resources, right? He's talking about the and uh, that's um, that's part of the objectification of. Of, of the environment, objectification of, of the world, where it's reified and made to stand apart from, uh, from, from the human and made to be a standing reserve for the potentiality of human resources. 
Um, I would say that that's that that kind of objectification is very much part of the modern project of science and part of the sort of logic that comes down to European liberalism. But I would have to work more closely in order to form a, a concrete genealogy that would lay those terms one one in relationship to the other. But I think um, uh, the th that you know Heidegger is is Heidegger's problem with modernity and his, his attempts to sort of to think outside it to, to overcome modernity, you know, to borrow the phrase, um, I, I think are, are compelled by his training in, in classical philosophy. So he would have been aware of these texts and they would have been part of his thinking. So I think it would have been definitely, um, I don't know, problematic to him, but it would have been thought of, it was something that he thought of, but I don't think, I'm trying to think, I, I, you know, I'm trying to think of moments where Heidegger talks about race, other than his his sort of his his dark moments where he you know turns sort of Nazi. Um, I'm trying to think of a text. Yeah, you know, um, maybe someone can help me out. I don't know where the text where he more thinks about race in in these terms of, of racialization of other parts of the world. Uh, is any any uh, major readers of Heidegger out there? I gotta admit, I kind of left Heidegger after I uh, after I got more into Simon Dom because um, you know when you read questions concerning technology, it's so painful because he just doesn't have the language to, to talk about what he wants to talk about. And then when you read thinkers like Simon Dom or, 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 or even Foucault, people will come after him. It's just so much clearer. And they're like they actually had the language to talk about the things that Heidegger was struggling to develop a thought around. So it's it's. I haven't read Heidegger in a while. I'll admit that. I kind of left it. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the talk, Michael. It's helpful to revisit these foundations of European political thought. I was wondering if you think this is going back to nature, that this going back to nature in recent post apocalyptic literature is a nostalgic move out of destructive guilt, so to speak, or if there's something else to it that's more forward looking. I'm not familiar with the text you mentioned, and I'm trying to find ways to engage the nature in non-nostalgic and non-salvational way. It's a great question. Um, think for a moment. The going back to nature movement in, who is this? Uh, Liliana Jill, do you have any text in particular that you, that you have in mind of the going back to nature text? Liliana? I think she, can you hear me or? Sorry, not really. Hi. <laughs> uh, okay. No, I was thinking because you mentioned this in relation to the texts that you showed, the books that you showed. So I was just curious yeah. what you saw in these books, if it was a nostalgic move or something else. Yeah. That you no, it's, a, it's a great question because I'm wary of the fantasy of going back to nature because, or this, this desire to go back to nature because. You know, who was I reading? There's a book called um, Notes from the Apocalypse, which is a wonderful, almost journalistic uh, review, uh, almost ethnographic exploration of all these extremely wealthy people who are building bunkers around the world in order to survive the apocalypse. And it's a really interesting book uh, that he also goes in and reviews all this sort of like, he talks to these people and, and looks at all these preppers who are getting all this equipment together and how they're, you know, they're getting their bows and arrows together and they're, they're learning how to, to field dress deer and how to live off in the wild and the, the, this whole thing about going back to nature. And for them, it's not an anxiety, it's actually a fantasy. They want that to happen. They want to be able to, to go back. And it's all about the gear. It's all about, you know, being able to go to REI and not having to use your credit card, just being able to, you know, to, to, to take whatever you want off the shelf because there's no more society. So there's all this fantasy of like of unlimited consumption that will be enabled at the end of the world because there's going to be no more authority, right? And then in all these texts, the most the, the most egregious uh, 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 manifestations of this is that there are so many texts written by white guys about the post-apocalypse and the kind of going back to nature where they're, they always have sort of the post-apocalypse post sex scene, which is always about they fall in love with this, this it's always this exotic woman who has who survived. And so it's very much a kind of fantasy about 
a new access to the exotic that, that's, that especially women, right? And then the women fall in love because they, they take care of them and they, they, they save them from the rough world of the post-apocalypse. So there's a lot of texts like that that I really can't stand because they're so predictable and they're so bad and they're just reproducing all the, the problems of that. Um, uh, there was one, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but there are a lot of them where there's sort of this, this, this the post-apocalyptic post -apocalyptic sex fantasy, that, you know, that's how I would say it. It's all about sex with the other, right? That you can only have within the post-apocalypse because once the, these white guys get out of their suburbs and then they have to encounter the, the, the ethnic female in, in, in the other parts of the world. So that's another part of these, these um, this what I would call not so much a, a nostalgia, but a fantasy, a fantasy of, of, of going back to nature and the kinds of uh, restraints that it lifts on this on these on these guys. You know, a lot of the literature is written by by men. So it's 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 problematic in in and a lot of it's written by people who know an awful lot about prepping, who know an awful lot about uh, about gear and guns. And so there's a lot that's that's all about gunfights and kinds of guns and kind of prepping and equipment and whatnot. And that gets a little bit, it gets extremely tedious and, and problematic for the ways in which I've tried to say here. So not all post-apocalyptic uh, science fiction is good science fiction. But that's a long answer. Yeah, that's a very interesting link. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Sure, sure. Thank you all for the questions. Any other question <coughs> or comment? James. Ah, you get, James, did you get your, your system working? Ah. <laughs> you can write it out. You try writing it out, typing it. We'll wait for James. <laughs> Think of what uh, Liliana has asked if there is any sort of non nostalgic, non salvational way also none this sort of male fantasy way of returning to nature texts like i have to think about it yeah like yeah. the eastern speculative fiction so yeah i mean i like the ones that try to imagine the idea of let's understand what governance where governance went wrong and let's try to rethink a kind of social order that's not going to just sort of reproduce the same problems of, of the state of nature and liberal theory. So the ones that are trying to think past liberalism, I think, and the only way to kill liberalism apparently is, is through post, is through the apocalypse, and they're trying to think about killing it and then and reviving as something different. And large is there a large difference in the variety of science fiction across cultures in terms of tropes of deeper philosophies being worked out and expressed. Um, Science fiction across cultures. I focus mostly on the stuff from the United States. I've read some of the Japanese stuff, which is which I do think is different. It it has different sets of um, uh, stuff that I've I've read as different. But you know what? The stuff that I've read is is, is shorter, and it's not. It's it's less post. I haven't read the post apocalyptic Japanese stuff except for the the movies that I've seen. You know, like Akira and things like that, right? Um, or or, or um, uh, uh, Naushka, things that, you know, those sort of movies are the only post-apocalyptic movies that I, that I know. Um, those are different in the kinds of states of nature that they, invo that they evoke. Um, the other stuff is, is uh, I've read Russian and Eastern European stuff where it's uh, the states of nature where people are reduced to living under the ground in old subway stations, um, or even uh, the the I don't know if, I don't know if um, uh, Solar counts as a, a as a Solar sorry Solar yes it is does that count as a state of nature I mean they're they're sort of like the whole planet is nature I mean it's sort yes. of this yeah it might count as yeah. No, I, I don't know. Yeah, you probably know more of the science fiction than I do on this. It's a good question. For me, if I were to answer this, I would say that yes. Okay, there is the thing that uh, there are some large differences, of course, and sort of reflections of the philosophies, because what is taken for granted is different everywhere else. The worlds are different everywhere else. Mm. Uh, however, there is, of course, like especially when it comes to recent work, uh, there is a lot of like uh, cross-cultural global sort of themes that are arising and tropes that are arising. 
but then uh, it's fun to see different uh, like I take quite pleasure in reading all sorts of different uh, science fiction everywhere from the world and then I also love eastern uh, like one of my favorite authors is uh, Stanislav Lem who's quite different than he also wrote for example robot fiction and I hate most <laughs> robot fiction authors but then I love Stanislav Lem uh, like yeah. that sort of differences are uh, like pleasurable to me and then uh, it also helps me explore different worlds that they have been released in so that I will say mm -hmm. yes and I would highly recommend uh, reading something from a completely different. Like, for example, we have when we first, no, when not when we first met. I think like when I tried to convert everyone to reading uh, Liu Cixin, the Three Body Problem, and mm -hmm. uh, it, it is, for example, it's very true. different than uh, like it was my first Chinese yeah. science fiction, and I particularly loved it. Then there is. Yeah all sorts of science fiction from everywhere in the world. And Japanese science fiction is too, though it can be, um, it is very much, I can say that uh, limited in terms of like their tropes, they have their tropes. Like science, Japanese science fiction has its own tropes and then they are very much limiting in how, what sort of works come out. So yeah. I don't know, uh, like uh, at first it might be interesting but then if you read it a hundred like uh, version of it then it might be like okay is it the same again but i can say yeah. the same for american science fiction too it's just yeah american science fiction the the the, the idea of the of the post apocalypse as this as this site of access to gear and ethnic women and you know the sort of the fantasy of 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 survival that's a very american thing i mean that that is a very american um uh, that's a very American trope about individualism and, and sort of the recovery of the real frontier, right? Uh, one of my entry points to Japanese science fiction was Akira. Have you watched that movie? It's like uh, for everyone, like I would recommend. Yeah. It was, uh, <laughs> I would say that it was a sort of post-apocalyptic movie, but when I watched it and I was again in sort of uh, studying political science as an undergrad and I was like, this is post-apocalyptic that you can imagine. It's like better than in many parts, like my actual society yeah. that I'm living. I mean, it was post-apocalypse like... before a post-apocalypse was cool, right? Yeah. So it was like, it was, it was, it preceded the whole movement. So it's a great movie. Uh, and when I watched it, I was like, that's not that bad. I was like, you know, this is the worst that you can imagine. And then yeah. uh, I got into it. So that's like, uh, I would recommend that sort of entry point to Japanese science fiction yeah. as well. And Clarissa here says that uh, there is a strong movement of Afrofuturism in science fiction. We also love like uh, African futurism, Afrofuturism. Mm. Uh, and I would love to read something from Brazil too, but like for me to be able to read it, unfortunately it had to be translated. Is there anything that you can recommend? In anything English? translation? Yeah, I would like yeah. that too, I need a note. Please recommend us things. <laughs> yeah. Um... Yeah, I hope that answers James. Um, and yeah. English now. Okay. Well, hopefully, someone will uh, like translate in the future. People are waking up to this sort of uh, world science fiction, so it's going to be. I They're being funny. woken up. <laughs> yes. Um. Any other questions? Okay, I have one question. Okay. So. Yeah, how do you think about the uh, anthropological intervention to the state of nature, like Marshall Salin's mm. or, you know, uh, classic work on uh, original yeah. affluent society and David Graver's take on that as uh, an yeah. um, anarchist anthropology. And he seems to see some commonality between Kropotkin and uh, Marshall Salin's. And I guess uh, Kropotkin had different take as she saw uh, the continuity between um, social life of animals, non-human non uh, you know, non species, social life and human sociality. So do you think it's a kind, you can see it, this kind of work as a sort of a variation of uh, the tradition of Rousseau or it's a kind of different take or inflection of that 
I'm yeah, just curious you know, about that. Great question. I haven't I haven't read that stuff in a long time, so I, I can't really say. I read Salins in graduate school. You know, I, I sit with Salins at lunch when we still have lunch, but we haven't talked about books in a long time. <laughs> um, but I haven't read his work in a, in in a long time. I'm usually what what is what is your thinking on that? What what how do you? Mm, I, I yeah, I, actually I don't know, but uh, you know, they, but I found that uh, this kind of anarchism is uh, has been quite influential in many parts of sustainability sustainability movement mm. everywhere, and uh, also uh, yeah, Graeber said that um, you know, um, original affluent society had a great impact in 1970s. So therefore, it actually affected a lot of alternative environmental movement. Mm. So in that sense, uh, it might be part of, you know, reality we live. So I'm curious yeah. about that. And also I'm not, I haven't, I haven't read Kropotkin, I just bought yeah. Japanese yeah. version. So yeah. I don't know if the Graver's claim that about the continuity between Salins and Kropotkin is really the case. Yeah, but I'm just, just really that, curious about that. Yeah, no, I'd be curious to, to, to I mean, that would be a great thing to, to think out. I mean, it would be a great mm -hmm. class to organize. Right, something around that that topic. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, the anthropological intervention to the state of nature. It's a great question to think about that. Fine. Yeah, sorry, Fine. I can't have a better. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> That's an answer. I would love it. We we should design a class. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, it's also exploring. This is, this is why classes are always great places to, to like you know, to work this stuff out. That's a great question. Yeah. So. Oh. Anyone else? Can I ask something? Um, yes. Ah, uh, yeah. Thank you for the presentation, and it was really interesting. And uh, I would like to hear you. What do you think about the 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 terrorism in the modern Europe, which is the other, which is which opposes com completely completely European liberalism, but this is. Uh, this is, you know, there was happening terrorism that was happening during the French Revolution and especially during the colonialism, for example, in South America, in the Amazon and in the, during the late 19th century and the early 20th century, uh, in the, in the rubber boom industries, the, the colonizers and the white men are controlled or Put order to to extract rubber with the uh, with the labor of of uh, uh, indigenous peoples. This is not this is really uh, completely different from uh, 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 from the the you know democracy liberalism, uh, education, enlightenment, etc, etc, et etc. Et but the, the order, the, the, politic, the political and the economic order in this system is completely controlled by terror, fear, uh, uh, upset, or lack of agreed. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you think about this? Yeah, that's it's, I mean, another it's aspect that... of the capitalism. Yeah, it's something that Mills talks about a lot, the, the idea that, you know, the European white male consents to the social contract, whereas the others who are, have this, who become the, the, who become the signers of the racial contract, never consent to the signing of their racial contract. So the, the contract is always imposed on them, whereas the Europeans are always imagine as as consenting or transferring rights or agreeing to being part of that contract. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's the best, I mean, there's Algiers, which is one which Fanon writes about, right? And then there's, there's Haiti, which, which, which CLR James writes about. And so I think they are the people who give us the best sort of picture of, of the efforts to, to, to thwart European colonialism and to to uh, uh, rebel against that system of exploitation that's placed on them, and you know, both the, both of those writers are somewhat 
ambivalent, I think, about the, the movements that they become part of. I think that, you know, uh, for Sierra James, it's very clear that, uh, that, um, that the Haitian Revolution ends up as kind of a tragedy because uh, the people who uh, overturn the Tazong the overturn the, the the leader of that of that revolution is you know he's someone who's reading Rousseau and he's reading European liberalism and he's saying to Europe look we're doing what we what we we're, we're having a, a we're coming we're we're doing what you you told us to do we're 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 I'm French you know I'm I'm I'm, I'm I'm, I'm just as much part of society as you are. Why don't you recognize me? And France is like, no, sorry, we're not going to recognize it. To the point where they'll send ships to suppress a revolution that was actually in the, was, was very much in line with the underlying ethic of, of the French Revolution. So it's interesting to see that, that those, those attempts to, to claim participation in liberal theory in all of the French colonies and throughout the rest of the world is completely suppressed and never, never acknowledged. And this, with, and it comes down to the fact that it's, they are just seen as, the other is just seen not as, not, not capable of entering society in the same way that, that Europe is. So there's really a, a strong line that's drawn between the European and other societies. So, you know, the question that Fanon asks in the end, you know, is, is violence the only means by which to, to recover some form of historical agency to to get out of the system of exploitation and I, and I think he, he gives a very ambivalent or ambiguous answer in the end about or ambivalently sorry ambivalent answer about about where violence goes and I think that uh, uh, um, Overture also gives a very ambivalent answer in the end about what ultimately the sacrifices that that are made in order to, to fight that system of exploitation. I don't think they're on board at all with, with I think terrorism is, is the last resort for them and something that, that once it started, it's very difficult to shut down. Or especially, I mean, we see that in the Haitian Revolution, that once that line is crossed, it's very difficult to come back. So it's a great question, it's very interesting, yeah. Yeah. That's my yes. Yes, um, I think it, it's interesting also to see how this, this idea of state of nature might have influenced uh, also conceptions of history. Uh, and thinking about, for example, Hegelian historicism and the impact this had on also on, on, on anthropology. I'm thinking about, for example, um, uh, Italian anthropologist Ernesto De Martino who, uh, drawing on this kind of historicism, um, conceptualized nature as a, as a backdrop, uh, as background upon which humans do construct history. So history versus a background of history made by humans vis-a-vis right. uh, -vis a, a background constituted by, by nature. Uh, well, I mean, just mm, referring to, to uh, a recent flip of this idea uh, is, is actually um, the analysis by uh, Iberos de Castro on, on uh, Amerindian uh, narratives and myths, uh, where humanity actually does pre-exist non-humans. Uh, does pre-exist nature in the sense that first there was a humanity and then there was a differentiation between mm -hmm. humans and non-humans according mm -hmm. to the Amerindian myths. Mm -hmm. So this was mm -hmm. just a, a reflection on, on, on historicism as, as a consequence yeah. of... Uh, I mean, history becomes another apparatus of colonialism. I mean, history becomes yeah. the, 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 whole, the whole question of history as having a telos to it, right? I mean, that was what was so confusing for China and Japan, this idea that, that, that there wasn't chronology, but there was actually a history that it was about a march towards progress and that the center of the world could actually move around according to those who fell behind. And so this whole thing about history being this kind of competition and you had to fight it out between, that was all like 
that notion of history is a very modern deal, it's a very modern temporality that, that is very much part of that idea of society and progress and modernity. So I think, you know, these texts are early texts in the formation of, of, of what we call modernity, but they can't be disassociated from the, the, that, 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 the, the temporal thinking that becomes part of, of history and age, being an agent of history and being an agent of progress and Tito's towards you know, this, this ultimate end. And the idea that one could fall behind in civilization and the historical center of the world could move to somewhere else, that's a very, you know, that's a very European idea that creates, a, as I said, a whole set of competitions over who's going to be the leader, who's going to be the new center of the world, the idea that the center of the world can move. Yeah. China didn't think that. They thought they're the center of the world, and that's where history is formed. And then all of a sudden saying, no, no, you're, we're the center of the world and we're going to take it away. So like that becomes a very um, different moment and very important moment for, 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 you know, as I said, history becomes a sort of an apparatus for, for perpetuating that colonial experience, right? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so any other questions? Final question, maybe? If not, I suppose we don't have any final questions. Thank you very much, Michael. Well, thank you all for, for staying. Thank you. And thank you. I have to ask again, are you okay with this being published sure, on sure. the YouTube site? Okay. I will, our closed, like our closed yeah, link. yeah, yeah. It will be unlisted, and I will put the link in one the Discord server, and then two in the Dropbox or the this drive, whatever we are using <laughs> at the moment, okay. as a link so that everyone will access to it. You can share it with your students. Please share it with your students so that they will learn too. So thank okay. you very much, everyone. You're tired of me. It's okay. Looking forward to seeing you. I'm. Hi, bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.